everyone for coming out today. My name is Jennifer and I'm the gallery director and I'm so thrilled to welcome you and to introduce curator Brian Edmonds and artist Jerry Sprecher. Um, this is our very, this is our second in-person artist talk since the pandemic hit and it's just really nice to see all your faces and what I'm going to do is introduce them a little bit and then they're each going to speak for a little while and then they're going to have a little bit of a conversation we'd love for you to have questions after that if you've got them. Uh, Jared Sprecher received his MFA from the University of Iowa and he's a professor in the School of Art at the University of Tennessee and living and working in Knoxville, Tennessee. Sprecher has had solo exhibitions at Jeff Bailey Gallery in New York, Gallery 16 San Francisco, Kim Key Contemporary Los Angeles, has worked and exhibited at the Drawing Center, Brooklyn Academy of Music, Irish Museum of Modern Art, Nerman Museum of Contemporary Art too. Sprecher is the recipient of the Guggenheim Fellowship and has received Artist in Residence Awards from the Marie Walsh Art Foundation, the Chinati Foundation, and the Irish Museum of Art. Brian Edmonds is an artist, writer, and curator based in Huntsville, Alabama. Edmonds has exhibited nationally and internationally in cities such as New York, Los Angeles, London, and Paris. In 2012, Edmonds founded Curating Contemporary, an online exhibition space, and since its inception, the site has hosted over 50 exhibitions. In 2019, Edmonds began publishing Eraser, his biannual book featuring the work of contemporary artists and writers. So with that, I'm gonna screw it on over and let them take the floor. Do you want to go first? Uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I think I'll, maybe just sort of try and give a little sense of my practice uh, in the sort of Reader's Digest sort of version. Uh, and uh, I'll hand it over to you. So uh, I'm Jared Sprecher. My painting is back here in the corner. It's entitled Ultraviolet. Uh, and it's about three years old, the painting is. Um, so maybe if I'm trying to sort of typify a uh, type of work I make. It's sort of like an adulterated abstraction. It's not like a, uh, you know, just sort of um, color form type of situation for the most part. Uh, there's some awesome examples you see, of course, in the show. Um, uh, but I tend to find uh, little bits of uh, representative uh, imagery, um, noise, odds and ends, a sort of flotsam and jetsam, and sort of pull that into the space of, of painting primarily. Um, but uh, maybe uh, as a way to sort of segue into the show, but also to give a, an understanding of how I think about how I use color and form and just the, the language of the materials around me. Um, when I was a young kid, uh, around uh, I don't know, 20, 21, uh, and a young art student, uh, I visited a nursing home to make drawings. And I, I did that over a period of like a year or more. And at that point, I, you know, I was enamored with Edgar Degas and Francis Bacon, artists like that. Um, and I wanted to make these figurative drawings. And so I got permission from a nursing home to go there and draw the residents. Um, and Oftentimes, you know, I, I was just sort of like a fly on the wall, you know, just observing and drawing. Other times I would sit down with the different residents there and have a conversation with them as I was drawing. Um, and fast forward several months of doing this, um, uh, there was one lady I was drawing, Esther, and as I was drawing her, um, my legs fell asleep. I needed a break uh, and needed to get up and sort of walk around. Um, and I asked Esther if she wanted to draw. She'd been watching me really intensely and close, closely as I was drawing. Uh, she said yes, and so she took the paper and pencil from me, and uh, she made a drawing like this. So two circles, and then another two circles, and then wrapped them in a box. And I was sort of scratching my head, because you know, anytime you're interacting with people and drawing, you're, you're seeing them you know, they're talking about what they can't or can draw, uh, what talent they have, things like that. Uh, Esther looked at me and she said, that's me. So she sort of grabbed her glasses like that. Uh, 
and, and I realized she was making like the four, four eyes uh, and um, making a sort of abstract symbol. Uh, and then uh, she picked up the pencil again and she made these series of parallel lines like this. And then she wrapped them in a box. And, um, you know, again, sort of like scratching my head um, and wondering, you know, what this was that she was drawing. She reached to her side and she grabbed a book out of her wheelchair and she said, that's the book I'm reading. So it's like she had made this like pictogram or a page of text. Um, so I was feeling pretty humbled at this moment uh, by Esther. Uh, and she picked up the pencil again and just a, a slightly quicker pace went like this across the page. Uh, and she looked at me and she said, that's me exercising. Uh, you, know, here, you know, here she was in a wheelchair, limited movement, um, but was able to just by a little bit faster traveling, traversing that page, uh, was able to, you know, implicate or give a sense of that motion that we think of as exercise. Uh, so it's not like as a, a young art student, I like ran back to my studio and like burned everything that I made up to that point. Um, but uh, there was a real education there in um, how Esther was able to have this sort of humor with what she was making. Uh, but also this directness uh, and uh, within the most simple of tools, uh, some graphite and some paper was able to sort of have that, you know, tremor of the hand, uh, the slight variation of speed and just sort of like capture that moment. Um, and, and so in many ways, that's been something that I think I've been trying to chase after as an artist uh, since that time. And so it really got me to think about like, what was my grandmother's handwriting like? You know, her, her beautiful cursive, but also that slight tremor that was in it. Um, or like, what, what are these chairs that we're sitting in? What do they feel like? What, what materials are they made out of? Like, who, who might have been the person to have designed them? And really trying to sort of like, look at the world around me for those like, um, bits and pieces, those clues, the sort of breadcrumb trails uh, to, you know, what, what the different things around us say to us. Uh, you know, so if, like when I go about making a painting like that, I'm going to be surrounding myself with lots of different things. Uh, there's an image of a bird that's really compressed uh, into that image, uh, and it's uh, a really degraded image that I've used a lot. Um, but in some ways it provides a, a sort of skeleton for me to use uh, in constructing a painting like that. So it, it, that painting, ultraviolet, balances a lot of maybe wants uh, in a painting. Like I wanted it to have a really intense color, to feel somewhat between the sort of manufactured or digital realm, uh, and I also wanted it to feel really like handmade at the same time. Uh, and so right now in my studio, I find myself sort of struggling with those things or like working with those contingent things, like those things that feel like, you know, you can find it like a leaf in nature, uh, but also something that feels like it's been made and handled um, or something that feels like it's brand new, like, you know, that ray of sunlight that just came through the window. Um, although it's about eight minutes, eight and a half minutes old right now, so, uh, <laughs> since it's traveled from the sun. Um, so that, that's uh, really like things that are rattling around in my head uh, as I'm working in the studio. So that's all handy. I don't know how I'm going to follow that. <laughs> <laughs> I should have gone first. <laughs> um, I, I'm an artist living in Huntsville, and in 2012 I started, as she said, CuratedContemporary.com, which is an online exhibition space, and from that time, I've, you know, just gravitated towards artists like Jared who were continuously pushing the boundaries of their work. If you've, and I've followed Jared since maybe New American Paintings, were you in that? Like yeah. in 2000, whatever, I mean, I, this is yeah. like it was, you know, a bit ago. Five or six yeah, or so like I've been a fan of his since then. And uh, I've seen his work grow and progress. And it's not really taken, it has not taken really like a linear progression. Like I see Jerry constantly like pushing and you know whether it be geometric forms or organic forms 
but it always looks like a Jared Springer. You know, it doesn't look like this is random, this is random, and then you know, Chuck Weedy in the middle. It's always Jared's work, and so uh, that's something that I wanted to include in this this show, and I'll talk a little bit about it in a minute. Um, but in 2012, I started curating shows. I was in a show in Brooklyn, and part of being in the show was to actually be in Brooklyn for seven days and to meet artists living and working in, in Brooklyn in Bushwick. It was called Bushwick Open Studios. And um, the curator, Julie Torres, really kind of brought us together and really taught us how to create a sense of community where we were at. You know, like I, I'm from Huntsville, to artists from Seattle, um, Philadelphia, Australia, London. We all came together and we all were uh, together for a week and learn from one another. And I brought that back with me. And one of the, the things that people commented on is even though I'm living in New York, there's really no place to show. There's nowhere for me to put my work out there, for me to get noticed. And so I brought that back with me and tried to curate some things in Huntsville, but just really didn't have much luck. And so I thought I would do the online exhibition space, which is what I call it. I don't think of it as a site. And I started curating shows and then pretty quickly I had other artists, other like-minded people wanting to curate shows as well and they would reach out to me and send me this big proposal and all this and I'm like, you know, I'm just someone living in Oslo with a computer, you know. <laughs> I mean like, you don't have to like, you know, will you please like, and I'm like, this is not, a, you know. So, the, you know, my name was not even on the website or anything like that and I kind of wanted to remove myself from it, you know, it was all about the work, not about me kind of thing and so, um, Anyway, I just continued to uh, go, and as I was telling Sarah, you know, before I knew it, I had two to three years worth of shows booked. You know, it was a, a monthly thing, and there was so much interest that I created another site, and then I had a blog off of it, and you know, interviewed people, and I just kept it going until, you know, I just kind of, you know, as life goes, you just have so much that you need to kind of downsize, and that's when I shifted to uh, book format in 2019, and it's something I've wanted to do for a long time, but just didn't have the know-how and, and, you know, really the time. And just one day I sat down and taught myself how to use InDesign and just, you know, did it myself. You know, I didn't really have anyone to bounce any ideas off of. I just, you know, looked at books um, that I had and just, you know, just figured it out, you know. And I think that's one thing that Julie and the artists in the shows that I've been in, um, you know, you can't wait on other people to to do it for you. You kind of have to make it happen yourself. You know, if I wait on someone to include me in a show or a book or, you know, or do something I want to do, then I'm going to be waiting a long time. You know, I mean, there's just not the interest there, at least locally for me. And um, so I took it upon myself to do the site, curate, and then engage other artists. And um, then now, you know, curate, or excuse me, feature artists and Eraser. And I have copies of these if you'd like to look through these. And that's where the title for the show comes from. Uh, the title comes from uh, Tom York and Radiohead. I love Eraser. It's something I listen to a lot in the studio. And I just love the abstract nature of the song. And then also, you know, Radiohead, they constantly push the boundaries of music with, within themselves. And they're, they're artists doing more abstract, more out there type of things than they are. But to me, you know, I love what they do. I mean, Every album is a little bit different. You know, they always have one foot in the future and then maybe look a little bit back and then find a way to meld the two. And uh, the same thing with the artist here, as I mentioned with, you know, with Jared's work. It seems like he's always looking back or always looking forward. There are always these things that kind of flow through his work uh, that I love and, and a lot of the artists as well. So, um, but yeah, and you know, I just, I love the idea of picking up a book and flipping through it, you know, especially with COVID. I mean, you can't get out, you can't see a show. Uh, you know, the online exhibition stuff is great, but again, nothing takes the place. If you can't be there, picking up a book and flipping through and then kind of, you know, seeing what's there, you know. And also, um, the book has, I don't know how many of you flipped through it, uh, but it features the art of six artists, has a poet, uh, and then also a short Q&A with each and um, when I asked people to contribute, Pete, I interviewed Jared. Um, 
there are no parameters. I don't say the uh, energy has to be like this, or I want you to do this. I just it's wide open, and some kind of struggle with that. And they're like, I don't know what do you want me to do. I'm like, I want it to be a conversation, not a casual conversation. Well, a casual conversation almost, but not a casual conversation. You know, I mean, uh, <laughs> what what are you wanting to know? If you sat down and had a beer with an artist, or you sit down in their studio, what are you going to ask? I mean, how are you going to talk about it? What you know? What do you want to know? as opposed to something like Art Forum that's so, you know, layered to pretense that it's like you need three dictionaries to, you know, figure it out, you know. To me, that's not enjoyable. I want to know what makes you, you know, what makes your work different or, you know, what you want to tell me about your work or how you think about things. And, and, I, and I love that. So, um, anyway, so Eraser, um, the work in this show came from the second book, uh, Sean Sullivan is right behind you. Um, his work is on the cover of this book, and um, and then Don is in the third book, and his work is right here. Um, so um, all the books I, I think of, at least in the beginning, I think of or thought of as like surveys of contemporary art. You know, I wasn't trying to put forward like this is what I think is valid, this is what I think is good, and only this is this. You know, it's just a survey of work that I love, that I think is good, obviously, uh, but it's not one type. It's, it doesn't have to be abstract painting. It doesn't have to be minimalist. It doesn't have to be that. So, uh, and then the first book kind of gravitated to the second, and then I thought, well, who are some artists I want to work with? And uh, I usually start with artists that I know or have met in the past, and then kind of build out from there. So usually six artists, two or three I have met, personally know, and then I reach out to other artists and uh, ask them to you know, be in the book or in the show. And um, there's so many scam artists out there nowadays, they are like, who are you and what are you wanting to do and how much is it going to cost? And, you know, it's <laughs> like Cecilia lives in the Netherlands and I didn't know her at the time. I knew Dawn, I'd been to Dawn's studio several times and you know, have beer with them and all that kind of stuff. And Cecilia kind of knew Don, so she was like, well, if Don thinks Brian's okay, I guess it's okay, <laughs> kind of thing. Because, I mean, I literally get something every morning like, you know, I, will you send me an inventory of your work? You know, I, la, 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 la. You know, it's just like the biggest scam we've ever seen. You know? but anyway, if you get those, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, um, so um, anyway, that's how I kind of build out from there. And that's, you know, why I started Racer I started curating, kind of like Jared, I kind of had an aha moment, you know, where yours was, um, the nursing home, mine was, you know, being in, in Brooklyn and meeting all these people and just like, you know, feeling part of a community, which I, you know, I sort of miss, you know, being in hospital, I just don't, don't have that, so it's nice that, you know, Ground Floor does this, and I was telling Sarah that, you know, this is kind of a beacon for this community, you know, for people to be able to show and people to, you know, come out and listen and, you know, be around other artists is a great thing. It's something that's sorely missed in this area, I believe, you know, at least where I live. Um, I just don't have that. So I think, you know, Sarah and Jennifer should be commended for having a space like this and allowing others to come in and curate shows and to show work like this. So. Thank, thank you all. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is Does anybody have any questions? <clears throat> if you have questions about a specific word or an artist, or, you know, I don't want to really, I mean, there are nine, nine artists and ten works, and by the time you, you know, like I know my students, I'm a teacher, you know, by the time I get to the third work, they're going to be like, you know, mm -hmm. they're just kind of like, it's too much, you know, I don't know if you get that or not. You know, no matter how great the work is, they're like, okay. Well, I, wonder, I wonder if you'd single out a couple or maybe just kind of go in, in depth about sure. uh, how, um, how each are like individually made and, and how that stands out to you. Right, well, uh, you know, when I selected the work for Eraser and I selected the work for the show, I was really um, just wanted to have a show of great works by great artists. I didn't really have an underlying theme uh, other than just, you know, spend time with a great painting that maybe you don't get a chance to see very often uh, locally. And uh, kind of went off of that. Now, with Jared's work, I'm kind of curious. So is this the image that I know I have one of your, your books, your catalogs, 
And is this one of the images from, you had talked about carrying around a photo album yeah. for years and uh, how you would come back to those images. And so is this one of the images? And, and how did you move from, like, your earlier work was more geometric, yeah. you know, shapes, and not necessarily hard edge, but more so than this, where this is an organic form, and you kind of move in and out of abstraction a little bit, you know, with uh, your recent paintings, the large works, you know, of flowers and organic uh, material, but it's still, you know, still yours. You know what I'm saying? I mean, like, this is more abstract than that, you know, that, that work. Yeah. Well, hmm. is it possible? Did, my catalog is just back there, and it has that image on it. Yeah, the, it's, it's called Memory. What was memory it? device. Yeah. It's the, the birds yeah. on it. <laughs> She's shuffling my like crazy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and what I, did, uh, I thought would be a good thing was I brought a bunch of books, a lot of catalogs from the artists in the show, and then so I, um, I brought Jared's, and they're in the back. If you want to flip through those, you can kind of see uh, some of their work. Uh, so you may have to sort of get that question back in my oh, mind. There, but back. so this is just the. Um, the image uh, that started the series of paintings. And it was this stock image, uh, which then I used for a catalog cover, um, was on my family's photo album growing up. So it was like, you imagine go to Kmart, you get those photo <laughs> albums, with the, you know, and you stick your photo in it. Um, at some point, my mom was upgrading the photo album so it was, you know, took all the photos out and was getting rid of it. Um, but this, you know, weird Kmart photo album with the stock image on both sides. What, what pulled you to that image of all images in those? I think there, were, like, there was something about it that, like, seemed sort of just, like, everyday or sort of, like, s sentimental. But it was sort of haunting at the same. You know, like, I think we understand why, you know, Kmart or whatever store, you know, decided, you know, it's like, a, it's a family of birds, you know, there, and they're nesting on a cliff. Um, and I literally carry this photo album around with, like, my box of sketchbooks um, for, like, 15 years or more before I finally decided to make a painting. I was like, well, if I make one painting, I'll get it out of my system. Uh, I won't have to, like, carry this. But this image has, has kind of resonated for a while, because oh, it's yeah. not the only painting like that. Right? Yeah, the first one I made it was in 2012, okay. and, like, there's still, like, I, I've got a series of images in my studio right now that are based off of that as well. How did you move from, you know, pure abstraction and geometric forms to more organic, more recognizable yeah. imagery? How, how did that happen? I, I think, you know, related to the experience, you know, sort of Esther's lesson, mm -hmm. um, it, it opened up this sort of idea of like, uh, uh, maybe a sort of freedom to just sort of draw from as much things as possible. So, you know, that I could look at Piet Mondrian and like look at those like shapes, those lines, those colors, that sort of pure language. Um, but also, you know, like look at the Sports Illustrated cover uh, or the, the drawing that I made that morning. And so uh, at times I think I sort of, you know, was like, well, I want to think more about somebody like uh, Agnes Martin or Piet Mondrian and would sort of like lean towards that, um, uh, maybe a sort of more like pure sort of language. And then other times it's like right now in my studio, it's like a complete sort of cacophony. There's a lot of like, um, it's, it's my Baroque period or something like that. <laughs> um, like, like really intense color and uh, really like uh, complicated images. You seem like someone that's constantly observing noticing but then also archiving that oh yeah you know when you talk about a chair or when you talk about you know a photo album or a sports illustrated or whatever it may be it seems like you're constantly just archiving and kind of pulling in these images and then kind of maybe regurgitating them later but where did the flowers come from i mean like where did that was it from a drawing or yeah, um, it's hard to talk about yeah it's like they can't see that image but mm -hmm. it's you know it's fairly prominent now in your work uh, I, I think I'm, after this, I'm going to come off as like the most sentimental person. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, 
Uh, when I was also uh, an undergrad in college, you know, being a very serious artist, uh, I came home or maybe went to a break, and my mom's like, "Can you make a painting of some flowers for the dining room?" Uh, and I was like, "Mom, I'm a serious artist. <laughs> I, I can't. I can't do that." Um, and you know, like three years later, I, I made a painting for my mom. <laughs> mom is happy. Mom has the painting still. So, um, probably wants another one. Uh, and but like actually like thinking about what my mom was asking me to do uh you know like we can think oh like something to, they just want something to hang over their couch that like goes with the room um but there's also like that can be like a real impulse to sort of like improve or change or affect the environment around us and so like that you know, even though we may have to turn the painting so it fits with the couch, um, you know, uh, but that there's a real like impulse to have that effect uh, or somehow you know change that environment around us. Uh, and so my mom asking for you know a pretty picture uh, was my way to sort of like dismiss it, um, but also like. Well, we, we need pretty pictures, uh, and we need complicated pictures, and we need objects that challenge us. Um, and and so, you know, I made this painting for my mom, but then about ten years later, I was like, oh, maybe I need to think about like what, what it is to paint a flower. Um, and so, uh, made a couple paintings uh, of a passion flower, which is like really weird looking flower um, and uh, made a painting of a cannabis plant um, which is another like weird thing um, but then all of a sudden these like ideas of the way that we surround ourselves with images of nature uh, sunsets cat posters um, you know flower paintings uh, weird paisley wallpaper that has these floral motifs in it um, you know you know, every screensaver that comes on your Mac when you open it up, you know. Um, and so we're always wanting to connect to that world, um, that the beautiful sunshine outside. Uh, but yet, they're all, we're also sort of like seeing it through a mediated way. Um, and so I think that's really the like space that I find myself um, thinking about is like, what are those images that we make as human beings? What are those objects we make? And then I'm always sort of questioning those or um, trying to like ad adopt an image uh, and maybe understand a little bit more about it and about myself and about the world around me by, by wrestling with it. Well, we always have, you know, attachment to certain images and they all mean something different to us at different times. Yeah. Let me move on to Jason Stoker is behind, he's next to Jerry. And uh, I met Jason in Bushwick uh, 2013 maybe. And his work was a little different, although the colors are very similar. He did, um, he had a series of paintings that were like just a basketball going on a black background. And it was just like the abstract version of a, of a net. Um, sometimes he would do things that, like 99 cent stores populate you know, the neighborhood and so, a lot of his work was um, for things that he would see in the neighborhood, you know, model caps, advertisements, pop uh, materials and such. Uh, Sean is on the end. Uh, Sean's work is on the front. Um, and let me show you, let me show people the, I'll reach out here, I'm sorry. Sean's work is uh, the spring suicide. Sean gave this to me as a, as a thank you for the, um, for including it in the book. And then on the back is an actual drawing. So you can kind of see, you know, where it came from. And then you can see the print on the other side. And so he has a method. And I'm not really sure. We've kind of talked a little bit about his method, but, and I know Doug and I have had conversations about it. He understood it a little bit more so than I. Um, but I just found it to be an interesting piece. And, um, 
You have Dawn is here. Dawn works with matte and flat colors oftentimes. Um, so he loves the play between the shiny and the matte. And then they're, they're structured, but, and then one thing that I love about the work of the, the show and in the books, you know, when you see a dog or you see a Jerry or you see a Matt or a Bodice or whoever it may be, there's no question about whose work that is. You know, that is their work and it's very distinct to them, although there are artists working in similar fashions, but you know, you kind of have an idea of who they are. And um, so like Sean, he uses a lot of color oftentimes, but he's very minimalist in his uh, execution. And uh, Vadis, when I spoke with her a few days ago by phone, uh, she said she loved the show that it was basically stripping away bare, you know, all the extra stuff. Like when you look at, the works aren't necessarily minimalist, but they're not a lot of extra anything, you know. I mean, even with Jared's, you know, there's a lot of color, but I mean, he's, it's almost like he's stripping away and you can see very central to that painting, you know, the bird in the middle and then everything else around it. So I love that idea about it. Uh, Vadis told me that she uses an armature. She, uh, she braids a um, uh, bed sheet and then she kind of loved the idea. This is called an agitated grid. She loves working with the grid and kind of messing with that. And um, she, co she covers it in resin and she said that she usually works on one piece at a time until she gets about 70 to 75% uh, complete with one and then kind of moves on to the other and then kind of works with that. So, and her work it deals with uh, domestic, domesticity, um, you know, objects in your everyday life and then she kind of gives them new meaning uh, by the way she works with them in her, her, um, her manner. Uh, Sean, not Sean, excuse me, Matt Kleberg is here. Matt lives in San Antonio. And I love his work. It has this, I think it's a great compliment um, to Bodice's work and Don's, color-wise, but also like texture-wise. So, you know, where Don's is kind of flat and matte, you know, and Bodice's is a little shiny, then um, Matt's work kind of has a different feel as well. And he used a little more on his um, canvas. Uh, Cecilia uh, lives in the Netherlands, and again, I kind of told you a little bit about her. I love her work. Um, it's, it's very neat and different than all the others, but it also complements those as well. Uh, again, stripping away um, all that she doesn't need. Uh, now, she uh, is really influenced by the landscape. She goes out into the landscape, takes pictures, um, and then comes back to the studio, and um, I just, I just love the work, the simplicity of it, and then just everything about it. Uh, and Thornton, I met Thornton back in 2013. He graduated from Tuscaloosa. He lives in New York, has since the um, 60s or 70s. And um, his work, I think, is just beautiful um, and so simplistic. Um, but uh, I met him in 2013, did a studio visit in 13, and then it kind of corresponded with him since that time. And uh, finally, you have Sharon Butler. Uh, Sharon is an artist, educator, lecturer, uh, blogger. Um, I, I met her again in 2012, 13, 14. Um, and I just love her work. Her work always has a sense of drawing in it. Um, this not as much as some of the previous work. Uh, and her previous work was fairly large. And um, she would take drop cloths, wash them, dry them in a, a laundromat, then iron them, and then reattach them, or attach them to the stretcher bar, and leave part of it uh, coming off the stretcher bar. And then she would have like a drawing uh, in the middle, or a painting that was very much like a drawing. So um, again, I just love the work in the show, and um, uh, I feel like they go together well, and, and again, the whole idea of it's just nine great artists, you know, 10 great works of art, and you get to spend a little time with each and engage with each. So. Sarah had a question. No, well, uh, you've answered. I yeah. wanted you to. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't going to do that because I was talking about it. But I, I just couldn't help myself because I hated to spend time with one and then I'm with another. So. Okay. I, I have That's a good. question for Jared. So, are you working like in a series or do you really have that freedom to? work in whatever way that you feel like you're working. Um, and because what you talked about, Brian, that no matter what, 
you can recognize that it's his. But, you know, where you talked about the elder person, I work with a lot of younger children, mm -hmm. especially ones with autism. There's a certain freedom. Mm -hmm. But when you're in between those ages, we seem to box ourselves mm -hmm. in, especially as artists, to, to make a series, to make it believable, to do the same thing mm -hmm. over and over. Um, and so I, I think what I find fascinating about your work is that sense of freedom as artists what you would want to be. Yeah. Um, oh goodness. Uh, <laughs> so many different ways to go. Um, I definitely, um, there was a, a good chunk of time where I thought of myself like really is like, you know, well, I'm going to do whatever I want uh, and just sort of like leave those things open. Uh, and so you walk into my studio and there would be like, you know, a, a big sort of hard edge abstraction. There would be something that would be like, uh, look like a remnant of like a, you know, blurred photograph. And so things would jump around a lot. There might be something that was like real material based um, and, you know, not necessarily a sort of oil on painting type, oil on canvas type of painting. Um, Right now, I find myself a, a bit more focused, uh, and I think maybe I was working through this series of, like, with the bird image, uh, and that allowed me to sort of, like, find an image, focus on it, and, like, if, if I keep turning it over, keep working with it, uh, you know, it wasn't that it necessarily, it didn't become exhausted, I was still finding out new things about it. Yeah. And so maybe, maybe when I was younger, I was a little bit worried about exhausting an idea. Uh, and I haven't found necessarily that, like, investigating something, investigating it again, I haven't found it to be exhausted. Like, I was sort of expecting it to. I know, like, Thornton well. And, um, you know, Thornton became very famous in New York, and he was selling his paintings for a lot of money. There's a Story about uh, Jackie Kennedy knocking at his door and buying this, that, and another. And he felt at a point that he was exhausted by that work. And, you know, his friends were Bryce Martin and people like that. And they were like, no, Thornton, do that work again. And, but yet he took the chance. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he lost his fame for a while yeah. because of of not recreating that, that same type of painting. Um, but I, I, you know, I, there's, there's certain boxes or formulas that I, I as, as an artist, like are we creating a formula? And we're just keep, we're, we're keep doing that same formula that got recognition? Or are we taking that chance? Yeah, yeah. And it, anyway, I think with any, you know, if you get recognition or the sort of positive feedback for something, there's a temptation to want to like continue to follow that, even if your nose is sort of pointing you in a different direction. Um, for me, my my cheat right now is I the you know the size of that painting right there. Um, I have lots of like small canvases and uh, sort of like paintings on paper. And it will literally be me at the end of the day of painting, like just cleaning my brush off on those things. Uh, and it's a little bit like staring into the clouds um, because uh, at this point, it's like my dirty rags, basically. Like, you know, I've got like 50 of these mm -hmm. like floating around the studio. Um, and I never know when they're gonna end. I never know when the, that image is gonna coalesce into something. Mm -hmm. And it might be something like, taking this idea of two circles interlapped, uh, like that sort of image that Esther gave me. Um, uh, or it might be, you know, this image of the birds nesting on the cliff. Uh, or uh, it might be me just sort of like seeing a face or a form or something in it and then just sort of, you know, finessing that image out. Uh, so that's been like, 
I, I consider it like my sort of a, an area of play for me that mm -hmm. allows me to keep things sort of fresh, fresh and new in the studio. So that, that's been a, a real gift uh, to sort of discover that sort of mode of working for me. Hey, uh, Jared, do you use any sort of digital processes in your planning phases? Uh, <laughs> um, that was a question. The, I had. The, the, it, uh, so I learned Photoshop uh, on the Macs that had the ticking time bomb. Uh, if remember those, it's like you asked Photoshop to do too much, and the computer said, "No, I'm shutting down." <laughs> um, and we're going to lose all your progress this long. Um, so I. I, I do, uh, but they're not necessarily overly planned. Uh, when I am using the technology, uh, it's in a pretty rude way, uh, a crude way. Um, you know, cell phone photos, um, and maybe using a digital projector to quickly get the image, you know, transfer it over to a canvas. Uh, that being said, the paradox that I am. Uh, I just bought one of those uh, tablets, the word the whack whack em. It sounds like, you know, it's a wake em, wake, wake em. em. Uh, I keep thinking of whack em all. Uh, I might get frustrated and start hitting it. Um, but I, I want to stitch together uh, some different digital images that I have uh, and also work with sort of outputting things, doing work. Uh, in the, that material sense, maybe sending them back through the computer. Uh, but there's, for me, there's been a real interest uh, in how digital technology has changed, maybe the, the, the way we interact or perceive the world around us. The same way, like you look at a painter like Manet, uh, and you can see how photography, uh, and even just the, the quickly changing pace of life uh, during his time period, uh, you know, like it somehow gets embodied, embodied or woven into the paintings. Um, and so I think that that's been a continuous um, concern of mine is like, and so that's where I, those, those, that digital influence comes in there. But I always want it to be a digital, if there's that digital feel there, I want it to also feel like it's been made and touched and moved around by thumbs. Mm -hmm. Would you guys talk a little bit about what it is that draws you to this zone, specifically a genre, versus representational work? Like my my favorite piece in the show is Belmonts, and it's the driest one, but I just love it. And I just love the color of the styrofoam and his his off white that he gets and those two different blacks. But why do you think that this type of work in particular is just has hooked you so deeply as artists? Um, years ago, um, I painted uh, landscapes, you know, in, in a way that was almost like had a Devon Cornish type feel to it, you know, even though that's San Francisco, you know, area, you know, I could get that same feel from the south with the trees swaying in the wind and some geometric forms, you know, I lived on a, on a mountain, population 400 in North Alabama, and you would ascend up the mountain and you would see this expansive landscape over time when you would see the kind of like the grid a little bit of like farmland and you know, intersecting uh, roads and such like that but I just felt kind of hemmed in like I couldn't I wanted to be able to explore and expand and you know just not be hemmed in by a certain like image or whatever it may be and you know so I went from abstraction into that and then kind of moved out of that back into abstraction. So for me, I just, and I love all sorts of work, it's just not for the show. I wanted things to fit a certain way. Uh, but Melanie Parkinson, in the first one, and she does interiors uh, that were similar to, uh, you know, like Matisse and some of those people. Um, but then it's kind of juxtaposed with someone that does like a gnarly modern sculpture, you know. Uh, so I love all sorts of work, but for the show, like for me personally, I love abstraction, I love minimalism, just because, again, it strips away everything that's unneeded, um, you know. So I love Don's work, and 
you know, years ago, 20 years ago, I would not have liked that anymore. So I think a little bit of it is growing older and experiencing more, seeing things, um, and then kind of making sense of the world. You know, um, to me, that's that's where I'm on that. So I had I brought the your catalog is underneath. Oh. Yeah. So if you just wanted to open yeah, it up. Yeah, so like, uh, so like, you know, this is not going to like maybe what Don would have done. And so kind of like uh, Jared, like, you know, I love shapes and forms. You know, I love the Z, which to me is kind of like a symbol. It's really not a Z. You know, it could be language, it could be text, it could be a symbol, it could be, um, you know, a, a, a car at night cutting its path through you know, the darkness, you know, kind of thing. I mean, it can mean so many different things to so many different people. Uh, so I love shapes and forms, um, you know, things like that. So, and my work, you know, 10 years before this was much different, you know, almost computer animated in some respects. Uh, so I'm just I'm fascinated with the modern world and the future and what all, you know, everything holds. I mean, we're in the 21st century now, so I mean, like, as a kid growing up, I was like, I can't imagine living in the 2000s, it's like, you know, 2021, or excuse me, 2022 now. So, you know, it's just crazy, you know, I mean, it's just like, things have, I don't know, evolved so quickly, I guess, in my lifetime, and you just blink, and there it is, you know, so. So, what makes you, I mean, like, again, we've, we've talked about change a little bit, so, what does abstraction hold for you that maybe representational work doesn't? I mean, like, what pushed you to do that as opposed to, um, you know, I, and I loved Demon Court. I brought him up because he did so many things so well. Yeah. You know, and he there was a pushback on, he was doing these great abstract expressionist type works, and then he went to the figure, you know, and the interiors, and there was a massive pushback on him. He kind of lost his fame, and, you know, he was like, that's what I want to do. And then he found his way back to abstraction because it just felt natural. So, I mean, why abstraction for you? I, I think, uh, in, uh, I don't even feel like an abstract painter. Right. I mean, I don't either, but it's just my, my aesthetic, I guess I yeah. just see the world in that way, you know. Yeah, uh, you know that there used to be these like you know, books and articles, you know, representation versus abstraction, <laughs> or um, photography versus painting, and um, uh, in in many ways, like it, you know, there are things to draw from, uh, and um, I just, you know, I've got. Pete in his uh, one of his questions uh, for a director, uh, you know, asked sort of about like what's you know the pantheon like who are the artists and you know for me you know there's artists like Agnes Martin where it's like you know they're able to just sort of like through the language like set up these repeated lines and all of a sudden one of those lines goes just a little bit off and it's like all of a sudden. It, you know, it's like a physical thing, like your ears start ringing or you feel it in your chest. Um, and some, you know, maybe it's like the cheap answer, you know, there's so many things that I like, but what I, I, I really like are artworks that somehow through how they function, like that Agnes Martin, like they sort of attune you to something. Um, but they're also requiring you to sort of adjust your assumptions, like uh, Agnes Martin sets up a sort of a world, and you know we have to take some steps towards that world, just as she's taking some steps towards us by making it. Um, you know, so when you, when you see a John Singer Sargent, you know you, you take some steps towards that world, uh, and just as that painting is taking some steps towards you, um, and yeah. Philip Gustin, there's just, you know, there's so many um, people and they've done so many amazing things. Yeah, so it, it's, you know, bringing that back on, like, I, this is such a wonderful show to be in, uh, just because of, like, for me, I walk around the room and there's, like, that, the, you know, either my ears are ringing or I'm feeling it in my chest. Um, 
just the how the materials are used, the like language that each artist has brought to it. Um, so you know, this this, feel, this is a good room. This is a good place to be. In. I like the idea of giving the painting what it needs. Like as a painter, I, you know, I'm not necessarily like I want my body of work to be cohesive, but at the same time, I don't feel the need to regurgitate. Twenty of those, mm -hmm. you know. I don't have to do a Z painting or a broken lightning bolt or, or whatever I want to call it. Um, but I just want to give the painting what it needs. So if it needs a little bit more geometric forms, if I need to pull back and it just be just totally flat and just centered image. And I feel like all the artists did that here. Um, I feel like they gave the painting what it needed. They were not. There was no agenda necessarily. Yeah. We're not trying to make this sort of painting. But this is what I'm going to do. And then it's just that's it. Yeah. You know? I was I was reading. Uh, I think it's the memoir by Christian Wyman. He's a poet and he was the uh, head of the Poetry Foundation for a while. And he was talking about um, having a conversation with another poet and he was listening to him talk to some students. Uh, and he's like, Yeah, I just took that word out of there because it wasn't right. Um, and like sometimes, you know, uh, as artists, it's like, Yeah, like, that thing's not right. Like it's right. it's too hard, or it's too soft, or it, there's too much color, or there's too little color. Um, do you ever get to that where you you do something, you're like, I've got to erase it now, but I'll come back to it at a later time because the work is not really ready for it yet. Have you ever done that? Uh, yeah. Like you know, like this is a, a great, but it's just not it's not what I'm looking for now. And then like two years later, you figure out a way to work that into your work. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. You know, there's things you do, and I'm like, that was weird. I, I should not show that to anyone, but maybe I need to hide it in the back corner of the studio. Um, I might be able to understand that in a couple of years. Well, if we don't have any final questions, we'll just go ahead and wrap and let you guys spend some more time in the gallery and enjoy the work. Thanks so much for coming. Thanks.